Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for a thought-provoking discussion on the state of the economy and financial markets for 2023. I'm pleased to welcome a panel of experts. Oliver Cartade, Head of Asset Management, Karsten Junius, Chief Economist, and Philip Berchi, Chief Investment Officer. Oliver, we seem to say this every year, but last year, in many ways, really was exceptional. As an investor, how do you look back on 2022? Thanks, Olivier. 2022 certainly was a year to remember. I would describe it as challenging at best and brutal as worst. Um, it was a year when geopolitics took center stage, uh, which had a significant impact on the financial economy and, and global markets. Between supply chain bottlenecks, a Russia-Ukraine war, and raging inflation, central banks had to scramble to withdraw the massive amounts of liquidity that they pumped into markets after the COVID crisis. And as a result, this had a negative impact on markets with both stocks and bonds down significantly. Just as an example how significant it was, a traditional 60-40 portfolio was down over 20% at one point through the year. And even though it recovered slightly to end the year down 16%, that was the second worst result on record in the past 50 years. In fact, it was one in five of the last 100 years where both the S&P 500 and U.S. Treasuries ended in the red. There were simply very few places to hide last year. Now, coming into 2023, I think it's a time to reset and reflect. Even though many of the issues that plagued markets last year are still present today, asset prices across many securities have moved materially, and we finally see opportunities starting to emerge. Also, 2022 has forced investors to come back to basics, demanding high-quality companies with predictable cash flows, trading at reasonable valuations. The end of the cheap money era has made investors reassess risk return. So they now have to look and truly assess whether the expected return on an asset is commensurate with its given level of risk. And in this type of environment, we think that active managers are best positioned to uncover and take advantage of those opportunities. Karsten, looking ahead, many are predicting a recession. What do you think? Are we already in a recession? How bad could things get? I think a recession really is unavoidable as interest rates have increased so much that it's getting really difficult, in particular for companies in the construction and in the real estate sector. But a recession might be milder than we initially thought. In Europe, we have this very mild winter. See, it's raining outside instead of snowing, which is bad for skiing. But it means also lower energy consumption, lower energy prices, falling inflation rates, and higher real incomes of private households. And then we have China, and it's surprising turnaround in its COVID policy. Of course, in the current wave, that means also a lot of disruptions to industrial production in the first quarter. But uh, from the second quarter on, latest, uh, we should see all this pent-up demand, in particular for services, uh, for travel, and for the consumption of luxury goods, uh, and all this should help uh, to pump up uh, aggregate demand in this global economy, meaning only a mild recession this year. Karsten, you mentioned that the recession is, is unavoidable, even if it's quite mild. It seems to me that the market is increasingly pricing a soft landing scenario, so no recession. I and mean, how confident are you in your recession call? And what do you think is the probability of such a soft landing scenario? So I believe that, that markets really are a bit more optimistic. Uh, they see the headwinds. Uh, but uh, they also believe that central banks are lowering interest rates in the second half already of this year. And this, in my view, is quite unlikely, as in particular core inflation rates are still too uh, elevated, uh, even in the scenario where energy prices are falling this year. We have this extremely tight uh, labor market, also for demographic reasons uh, right now. And tight labor market uh, means uh, low unemployment rates uh, and usually also stronger wage uh, pressure. Central banks definitely don't want to repeat the mistakes of the 1970s uh, when they loosened uh, monetary policy too early, which then led to another round of inflation 
high inflation rates, high wage rates uh, and another round of higher interest rates. Carsten, lately we've been seeing the US dollar um, softening a bit, but uh, do you think valuations of the US dollar are, are still a bit stretched? I mean, uh, what can we expect uh, for 2023 from the US dollar? So I think the US dollar still is quite expensive and everyone who has been traveling to the US could, uh, could see this. So it needs to come down. And finally, we also have a reason why it comes down this year as uh, we forecast that uh, the US central bank will be the first one who stops hiking interest rates uh, while the others still increase them. And this means uh, a lower interest rate advantage uh, of the US dollar, which usually leads uh, to a lower valuation of the currency. What we like this year instead uh, is the euro, the Swiss franc, and in particular, the Japanese yen. Okay, so a weakening US dollar going forward. Uh, what does that mean for investors? Well, a couple of countries benefit from that. Uh, so what we like particularly are emerging markets uh, that benefit from a lower US dollar. And additionally, they also benefit uh, from the new COVID policy and the strong growth perspective that we have in China. So Philip, Karsten has given us lots to think about. Given that background, uh, how have you positioned your portfolios? Well, currently the level of uncertainties are still uh, very high, but nevertheless, we think that 2023 will be a much better year than 2022. There is a wider range of outcomes. As Carson mentioned, the US is likely to enter a recession. On the other hand, in China, we have a rebound from the second quarter onwards. So overall, at the portfolio level, uh, returns might be in mid-single digit uh, range. But there might be big differences between different asset classes and also between uh, regions. In terms of equities, we remain underweight, a position that we have adopted in the second quarter in 2022, a position which served as well to reduce volatility in portfolios throughout the second half of 2022. There are three reasons why we uh, are still underweight in equities. The first one is uh, that the central banks are still tightening monetary policy. The second one is that the global economy is still slowing down. And the third one is that equities are not really cheap. Oliver mentioned that equities have repriced to some extent, but still there are also there big differences. On the one hand, in the US market, many companies are still quite expensive and we think the derating could continue. On the other hand, in China, for example, we see a lot of very cheap companies and here we see more upside uh, potential and good opportunities. So there are big differences and we want to use them. That's why we continue to have an overweight in cash as well, so we can use uh, tactical opportunities if and when they arise. In fixed income, we are currently broadly neutral positioned, having adopted this stance over the last few months, adding uh, high quality bonds as yields have uh, increased throughout the year. Speaking of fixed income, where do you see uh, the most attra attractive opportunities? Well, within fixed income, we particularly like high quality bonds, uh, shorter duration ones. We think that they have the best risk reward at this point in time. And also as we are heading towards a recession, we think it's a bit too early to increase the allocations to credit. Having said that, over the medium term, uh, we think that high yield bonds and also emerging market credit is quite attractive and uh, offers good opportunities and good returns over a 12 months horizon. And on equities, you mentioned an underweight cautious positioning. Uh, but what do you think about the attractiveness of uh, dividend stocks? Yes, that's correct. I mean, we are cautiously positioned mainly because we think the economy is slowing down, profit marches are likely to come under pressure, and so earnings are likely to disappoint. So in such an environment, you want to focus on companies which have stable cash flows, which have strong balance sheets, and you can find a lot of those in sort of the dividend uh, space. So we think that dividend payers companies who can pay their dividends on a sustainable basis year after year, these are the ones that are favored in uh, the current environment. Oliver, Philip has given us his view on uh, bonds and equities. How about alternative investments? Uh, where do you see uh, the greatest opportunities there? Look, although 2023 is expected to, to bring a fair degree of turbulence with it, I come into the new year with, with cautious optimism. I tend to agree with Philip. There are some exceptional opportunities in the fixed income space, given the, the significant increase in rates over the past 12 months. 
However, once again, I see some of the most attractive opportunities across the alternative investment uh, landscape. I think the role that private markets and alternative investments have in portfolios are more important than ever, as these strategies are uniquely positioned to really take advantage of the new area we live in of higher rates, higher inflation, higher volatility. And more and more strategies that were once only accessible to, to very large professional investors are now finally available to private clients. For example? For example, private credit. Um, it's an area that continues to grow as public financing retreats and companies have the ever-growing need for flexible capital. And even though investing in these bonds, you, you give up uh, liquidity because they're not publicly traded, the extra yield that you pick up on these bonds, coupled with the extra protection you get from stricter covenants, by far compensates for that liquidity risk. Today, you can build a portfolio unlevered uh, of diversified private credit and earn, and earn double digits. It's very attractive. Even in a recession? Look, these are companies where if we go through a, a deep recession, of course, they will be impacted. But I look back to the great financial crisis of 2008, which was a great litmus test where we went through a deep recession. And these companies held up well and managers, high quality managers of, of private debt performed well through the period. Another area is private equity. Valuations have come down. And in addition to that, uh, in 2023, we expect a significant increase in buyout and merger activity. Both these elements should lead to much more opportunities in the private equity space. I would say that on the earlier stage in venture capital, I would be a little more cautious and patient. I think the valuation reset there is still under process. Some of these early stage companies raised money at extremely high valuations in 2021 and are still clinging to the hope that they can do a next round at similar valuations, which our view is that they'll have to throw in the towel at some point and lower their, lower their sites to a lower valuation. Lastly, another area of the alternative space we like a lot uh, going into 23 is the hedge fund space. Hedge funds typically perform very well in periods of higher volatility and higher rates and can extract additional alpha on top of traditional investments like stocks and bonds. And we think this, this year will be a perfect year for them to perform. All right, so uh, we're almost near the end and I have one final question for each of you. And that is to know, uh, what is your uh, top investment idea for 2023? And I'll start with you, Philip. Well, in this challenging environment, I like banks. Why? Because balance sheets of banks have improved a lot over the last few years and they benefit from the rising interest rate environment. Within banks, I would focus on credit, so financial bonds, rather than equity because of the better risk-adjusted returns. How about you, Karsten? Like Philip, I would also try to benefit from the higher interest rate environment that we have uh, this, this year. Last year, it paid off to be a overweight in cash. And this year, I think the most important decision to make is to use some of this cash and invest in bonds again that are giving attractive yields again. Oliver, what is your top investment idea for 2023? Well, it might not be the highest on an absolute return basis. On a risk-adjusted basis, I think a diversified portfolio of high-quality hedge funds are very well positioned to perform in this market. And that's regardless of whether we have the soft landing, as Philip said, or a mild recession, as Karsten said, this environment is well suited for them to generate alpha. Well, I think uh, you've given us all a lot to think about and we're looking ahead to another interesting year, uh, certainly from an investor's perspective. And I want to thank our expert panel for their insightful comments today. And to you, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a successful and wonderful year 2023.